It's Adam from Pixel, and it is my pleasure and my honor that my first art book review of 2021 be The Art of Ori and the Will of the Wisps. And there's several reasons for this. Number one, it is among, in my humble opinion, the most, one of the most beautiful video games of all times, uh, artistically. Second to nothing. <laughs> this is an absolute masterpiece. This, within the style of art that it, that it is, more of a kind of an animation type of style to it, this is, in my opinion, the most beautiful game I've ever played. This and Ori in the Blind Forest. I'm also very lucky because I wasn't expecting this book for another month or so, and I was hoping I could make this book my first of the year, since this is my second official year doing art book reviews. Um, and third reason is because this, a lot like Breath of the Wild, is a game that both my, me and my son Lucas love together. And I very much kind of connect this game to Lucas in a sense. I, f I almost feel like Ori's kind of uh, uh, the little spirit creature version of Lucas. He kind of has a lot of the same personality in that sense. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's crack this open and Right off the bat, I just want to flip through a few pages just to give you a taste of, within just a few pages, the incredible beauty. I, how else can I describe it? I could try to be more technical with my description of it, but it's just gorgeous. It's just a gorgeous game. Not only that, notice how the mood shifts very quickly from one piece to the next. Just gonna, I just want you to enjoy some of this artwork. Now, I'm not doing a full flip through. That's not the kind of book reviews that I do, okay? I'm giving you my opinion, kind of giving you my feedback on, on the book itself, but I'm not gonna, I'm not just gonna flip through it without saying anything. Here's one of the things that I love so much about this game. A lot of the book reviews that I review, um, for very justifiable reasons, use a lot of artistic shortcuts like photo bashing or 3D plates, or they kind of, you can see a lot of the speed that goes into creating this. In the case of Ori, in very large part, with maybe a few little exceptions here and there, in very large part, a lot of this is done entirely by hand. The foreground and background ob objects are all animated, very two-dimensional, using a very old school technique of parallax animation. And if you wanna know what parallax animation is, you can kind of get a sense of it with my camera. See my camera moving back and forth, and I've got the, the foreground objects. Well, it, in traditional animation, if you ever studied animation, you'd be familiar with this you'd use separate plates on glass, and each one of those plates were at a different distance from the camera, and they would all move independent of one another to create this sense of movement, where things in the foreground would move a little quicker, and things in the background move slower. Exactly like you're seeing with these flowers in the foreground, with me and the objects in the background. And then that's how this game is built, using very old school traditional animation techniques. But if you actually stop, one of the things I always encourage anybody playing this game to do is stop. Put the remote down and just look at whatever screenshot you're looking, whatever, wherever your character just stops and take a moment to take in the depth of design that goes into every single moment in this game, in both of these games. Every, you just stop there for a moment and you look around and you look in the background, the midground, the foreground, and you look at the, the grandeur of the work that went into this, this one screen that you could completely take for granted and just fly right by. It's incredible and it's so immersive and rich with detail. And believe it or not, with all the richness of detail that's in the game, one of the things that they discuss moving forward in the game, in the, in the design book, is how they really had to reduce a lot for the sake of not overburdening the game engine. So what you're actually looking at is the, is the slightly reduced version of it to make the game a little bit more playable, believe it or not. And on top of all of that, all of these different assets in the game, these foreground and background designed assets, are all moving and animated to get this sense of movement and glittering and little fairies flying around. It's stunning. Now, <clears throat> see, we're on page one and I'm already shooting my mouth off. When it comes to Ori, one of the things I love about the design of Ori, and one of the things that's explored here in this page, and if you look through in the next page as well, is how they explore different body types different kind of, different shapes, different ways of designing them, maybe through different phases and stuff like that. 
And what they ended up settling on was probably the most neutral character you could get. It captured cuteness, it captured his smallness, his innocence, his kind of whimsical personality. But if you look at him in terms of his expression, he's very much a blank slate of, of, of an expression. He, he's not overly expressive. And there's a lot of strength of that. I've discussed this in, in for instance, uh, the Souls, the uh, design works for the Souls games, which you can check out here, okay? In it, how Miyazaki always made a point with his design. You can see this in everything, in all of his different designs. He made a point in the Souls series not to create too strong a facial personality in the characters. And for multiple reasons, one of it to make them feel soulless, so that they don't, you, you don't sense their anger and their emotion coming at you. They're just mindless creatures, right? Which is much more powerful and perhaps a little bit more intimidating. But it allows the audience to project their own imagination onto these characters. There's a lot of power in not saying something and not overstating yourself. The same thing could be said, I was just speaking with somebody the other day about uh, Gisław Bekczynski, the artist who didn't title his work. He didn't like to say, this is what the painting's about. He didn't have a description. He just paints what he feels. He puts it out there and he allows his audience to come up with whatever interpretation they want, have fun. And he doesn't argue with somebody has this, somebody has that interpretation, let him go with it. That's the fun of it. And the same thing applies to Ori. He's surrounded by, by his close ones, by his kind of, kind of his family unit, so to speak. And he's a reflection of the emotions of everybody else, of the parental figure, of the whimsical figure, of his buddy. And there's all these little characters that play against him. So if he's got a very strong personality, that too strongly sets him in it. And if you think about it in terms of how he, how he reacts to certain things in nature, it might risk anthropomorphizing him a little bit too much, humanizing him a little bit too much, which goes against why we very often feel empathy for nature, for creatures, for, 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 wild, for wild animals and stuff like that, okay? There's a lot, there's more to what I'm saying, but I just wanna kinda of set the stage for you moving forward through this design. Same thing with his friend Ku, who's kind of very much designed off of a plush doll. And if you look at Ku, if you look at his design over here, the young version of him and the grown-up version of him, if you look at this page over here, you can see how having different eye types, having different types of expression in the eyes suggests a little bit more compassion, suggests a little bit more magicalness. And that risks pushing your interpretation of their acting in a very strong direction. Well, you'll notice by neutralizing his face and keeping him, giving him a little bit more of a blank stare, you internalize his emotions a little bit more and you interpret them more through your own lens. That's a lot stronger, isn't it? There's something else. Ku has a bad wing, kind of like Nemo's bad fin, right? And he can't fly as a result of it. It, 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 it affects the way he, that he flies. But when you look at characters like Ku and Ori, Ori is a little innocent creature who's lost in this big, dangerous forest full of predators, mindless predators that don't give a crap if he's cute. They just want him for dinner. And Ku, his friend, and these two creatures, these two forest creatures become friends together. They bond. And they bond based on this similarity of the fact that they both are dealing with, uh, they're both children in a sense that are dealing with unfortunate circumstances, de dealing with some of life's challenges. But they're not, their, their blank expression makes them adaptable to the unfortunate circumstances that they live with, like a bad wing or like being a little creature who's having a hard time defending himself against these predators. So they be develop a relationship through that. And if you look at their behavior, it's very innocent. It's very accepting. And that's one of the things that make me think so much of my son of Lucas, because he's a little boy, and when bad things happen to him, he just kind of accepts it sometimes, you know, like I'll say, how was your day at school? And he goes, fine, okay. And then I find out later on that it wasn't okay, that maybe somebody bullied him or something bad happened. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And he is, he, he's not complaining, he's not whining about it, he's just adapting to the reality of circumstances. That makes me feel even more empathy for him, because he's, that means he's keeping his hurt inside. Or if he, we were playing with snowballs outside and a big snowball hit him in the face and it was a good heavy snowball, whacked him in the mouth. 
And I was like, oh my God, are you okay? He's like, I'm fine. And his mouth is all red, you know? And I'm like, that's what makes it sad. And that's what makes you fear, that's what tears your heart out and makes you feel for these creatures is that you can see the challenge of their circumstances. This is captured beautifully in this game. You can see the challenge of their circumstances, but they're not complaining about it. They just move forward through it. And there's power in that, isn't there? But it's not to mean that he's completely alone because he's got Naru, his kind of, his mommy figure. And it's amazing, one of the things, I would say that the Ori game, uh, along with CD Projekt Red's games, for instance, like Cyberpunk, like uh, Witcher, have been written so beautifully as to pull you in and make you invest yourself emotionally into these characters. And I would say there is no game more successful at this than Ori, in that in the first, literally, if you've ever played the game within the first 15 seconds of playing it, you've got tears streaming down your face. It makes you fall in love and then rips your heart in half. And it does so in a very true to nature way. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't embellish. It doesn't over Hollywoodize its statement. It's very real in a sense. And to me, this means that it's, it's whoever created the artists and the directors and the writers that made this game understood and observe nature and animals and love it, love animals and love nature and respect its behavior and respect it. Um, uh, the balance of nature and capture that in the game. I know I'm saying a lot, but this is all important. And this is one of the, one of the things, that, one of the underlying unsaid things about this game that I feel make it so rich and make it so meaningful. When you get into the Moki, it's a, Again, you don't want, they didn't want to suggest anything too, anything too specific. You can see through these quirkier designs. So they ended up falling on something that was a little bit more neutral. Curious creatures that trying to figure out whether or not Ori is good or bad, friend or foe, and end up realizing and kind of coming to terms with the fact that he's okay. So they end up assisting him moving forward in their own way. Or Warlock. What a perfect name for a frog. And, and it makes me think of a Brian Reagan joke, you know, like who the hell came up with the sound bow wow, hearing dogs, you know, like you hear a dog who thought bow wow, where did the hell did that come from? Do you hear that? Do you hear that dog? You know, roof, bow, woof, wow. Did you hear bow wow? I distinctly heard bow wow, right? The hell did they come up with that? But quolok, that's a, that's a frog sound. And he's this huge, majestic, ancient creature. I love the fact that he's so ancient and he's so still that nature grows on his back until Ori shows up and he pulls himself out of the ground like this. Makes me think a lot of the um, the hut, the witch's hut in God of War, that huge turtle that's got a whole plant, a whole garden growing on his back. I love that. That's gorgeous. The other thing I love about this is the relationship between big and small. Again, with respect to nature, that nature does not does not have a bias against large or small that a little dog can can out can out intimidate a big dog depending on his energy depending on his pheromones depending on the aggr his aggressivity so the same thing goes for the goodness of it where Quolok respects Ori as being a very important creature and respects him and assists him doesn't look at him as going a little doesn't treat him like a little pipsqueak actually regards him in a very big way so it shows that it shows that respect that nature has for all creatures, big and small. Now, when you get to the actual environment design, as much as I love the character design, the environment design speaks for itself. And it is a, I could, the best way I could describe it, actually, you can go back a page. The best way I could describe the environment design is an interactive color key. It's the best way I could describe it. And what I mean by color key, if you've seen any of the art book uh, reviews that I've done for anime, for, for animated films like, uh, 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 I have them all here, like uh, The Incredibles, or Big Hero 6, or Ratatouille, or Tangled, or... Did I do Tangled yet? I don't know if I've done Tangled yet. I don't think I've done Tangled yet. Coming soon! Um, for any of these animated films, you'll always notice that there's a spread. There's a You can open up in the centerpiece, and there's a whole spread, which is a color key. And it's basically every scene kind of summarized in a little graphic design, a little thumbnail, 
that shows you the visual progression of the film from the first scene all the way to the end to kind of give you a, you can kind of scan through all of the colors to give you a sense of how the mood shifts from beginning to end of the film. Well, this game is quite literally that, but interactive. And the way they balanced it, I have to tip my hat to the, to the artistic director and the game designers who so flawlessly knew when to shift the mood and what to shift into. So you start in, in what starts with more of a, a habitation, a, an area where Ori and his family live. And you can see, and that's described in the house and all of these little swings and how they really kind of brainstormed how they would sleep, what they would eat, how they would transport things, how they would get water, etc., etc. Kind of like if you ever look, if you ever have gone camping, notice how you kind of park your car into an empty lot. And then within two hours, you've completely personalized it into your little home with your tent and your pots and your pens and the laundry line and, and all of this different stuff. And they've kind of caught that essence here. But then moving forward into the game, this is more around kind of like their area, the winter wonderland type of thing. They're still home. Uh, and in this shot, this one, they were describing how this scene, there's a transition from sunrise to sunset. And this composition was create, was meant to create the sense of home and comfort, but also to suggest longing. So the compositionally kind of cuts off here, showing how they can't cross in a sense. It's it's more of a subliminal suggestion. It's more of a it's more suggested, but kind of looking off into the distance to get the sense of longing for adventure, longing to move forward, right? But then when you get into the forest, everything becomes completely wild, uninhabited. And that's where things start to become more threatening. And so they're exploring all of these different um, ways of using contrast and color to create a sense of toxicity or danger or jagged edges or, or fear or fire or whatever the case might be. And here in the marsh, they were talking about how they were exploring, they wanted to explore uh, how to make this marsh feel lonely and cold. So they kind of had this murky green in this one over here and then here they ended up using a little bit more of the cold tones to give it more of a cooler feel to it. Talk and his little buddies over here, the, the, the wanderer kind of like, you kind of picture him being the hippie you meet on the road while you're on your travels type of thing. You know, he's sitting there smoking a beady or something like that. That kind of hippie guy with his long hair. He's like, hey dude, how are you doing? He's kind of has, kind of has that personality too. Again, playing around with different colors, these beautiful yellows, lovely. Notice here as well, if, I don't know if you can see it, but all these little spikes. We're getting into the to toxic colors, which again is an observation of nature. Different creatures, octo octopi, octopuses, octopi. Let me know in the comments below. I can never remember that one. Or, you know, different types of wasps or different types of snakes. Their coloring uh, is an indication, it's, or it can even be a fake indication of the potential of being poisonous, venomous, right? So um, playing with these toxic colors to kind of get, give you these little, these little suggestions of don't touch, danger. This page on both sides actually has a lot of interesting stuff to say. Lupo is all about maps. So they designed him. Look at this for clever, thoughtful design. They gave him big eyes to allow him to see better in the dark. Look like goat eyes, right? And they gave him big eyes to be able to analyze and study maps. He's all about studying maps. You can pick just giving him these big staring eyes gives off the impression you can see his fascination always staring at things. So he's got his eyes are in a permanent state of bigness. But not only that, if you pay attention to his fingers, I don't know if you can see, let me zoom in a little bit. If you look at his fingers, <clears throat> they're ink stained because he's constantly fingering maps. Isn't that cute? I love that as a design, as a design element. Now on the opposite page, we zoom out here. On this page over here, this was actually what I was talking about before. Um, they were exploring overloading the assets, seeing how far they could push uh, as many different elements in the scene with colors and elements and design and, and all these different things, really loading the engine to see how far they could push it. And it was kind of a way of stress testing the system. And they knew, okay, this is pushing it to its limits and then they knew to dial it back to a certain point where they could get the most design, the most richness of environment without lagging out the system and, and causing system crashes or whatever the case might be. So this is quite literally a visual stress test 
for the system. Thought that was kind of neat. That's freaking gorgeous. Now I'm going to end on this lovely murky piece that one of the things I love most about games I've noticed. I noticed this in Vashir in World of Warcraft, this abandoned underground murky moody place camping out trying to find this little spirit crab named Ghostcrawler, named after the, the game developer. I remember the lovely feeling of being lonely in this lonely little private place where there was nobody else or in the outlands of of night city where all the kind of like factories and like the mud and the outskirts kind of like the edge of night city so to speak where nobody goes it's this kind of abandoned area and you just drive into this kind of like dark murky muddy place i love lonely places and this captures this in such a beautiful way this the bottom of this catacomb where old bones float down of carcasses float down and just you know collect moss and it's so deep that not even moss can grow on it because things die, there's not enough oxygen or not enough not enough sunlight to allow any kind of lichen or any kind of uh, uh, moss to grow i love this i absolutely love this and i'm going to end here because of course i only want to whet your appetite i want you to buy this book i want you to support the developers and the artists and like I said, my hat's off to probably one of the most beautiful artistic achievements. I would say underestimated, underappreciated artistic masterpieces in video gaming. So that's all I've got to say about it. Thank you for producing this beautiful work of art. And if you want to pick one up for yourself, I'll leave, I'll leave a link to it in the description below. All right. Thank you for watching. Take care.